So far in integrated studies, you have been immersed in five weeks of a problem-based learning investigation. For some of you, the reasons why we've done this have become quite apparent as those five weeks unfolded. However, for some of you, the mysteries behind what we've done, how we've done it and why we've done it may still be a little murky. So the purpose of this online lecture is to unpack the pedagogy behind the island investigation to help all of you understand the purpose behind what we've done and how we've come to design this particular learning experience for you. And this may well help you all as you think about your assessment task three and how you might think beyond your assessment task and think about what from this immersion in a problem-based learning scenario you can incorporate into your own teaching practice at the end of next year when you've successfully graduated from your teacher preparation program. Many of you, when you're on placement, see what many of your lecturers might consider as fairly traditional teaching, a traditional classroom based on or centred on the voice of the teacher. What we wanted to do in this particular course is to expose you to alternative ways of running a classroom. And many of you have yet to see true inquiry-based or problem-based learning. So we felt that the best way of helping you to understand this alternative is to immerse you in a problem-based learning investigation as a student, so wearing your student hat. And it's often through immersive experiences that we uh, achieve our most effective learning. Just telling you about problem-based learning has very little impact. Immersing you in it so you experience it for yourself, the theory tells us, um, leads to a far greater familiarity and understanding about this type of learning and teaching. One of the other things that we wanted to demonstrate to you is how problem-based learning, when done properly, really challenges the power relationships in a classroom. Many classrooms that many of you may have seen are centred very strongly on the teacher. The teacher is the focus for most of the day. And whilst for some of the time that's okay, there are alternatives and it's the alternatives that we wanted to expose you to. The alternative centres around the student or the students being at the centre of the relationship in a classroom. The students thinking more independently rather than simply listening to the instructions and the direct instruction of the teacher. And it's this thinking that is really important. And I'll come back to the thinking a little bit later in this online lecture. When you give over to the students in a problem-based learning uh, teaching environment, you shift from a teacher who is in a position of authority to a teacher who is in a position of a facilitator. And as a facilitator, you teach and learn alongside your student, which really shifts the power base from the teacher to a more student-centred approach. And so we wanted you to experience what that felt like. Whereas the teachers, we don't hold all the answers. You construct those answers as a result of the learning that you engage in. And in doing so, we're using problem-based learning as a vehicle to deconstruct the power relations that exist within a classroom. We wanted to give you an opportunity to reflect on and improve your awareness of the entrenched beliefs and values that exist in many classrooms and how these can bind you to a traditional teaching dynamic. We wanted to challenge these entrenched beliefs and values. We wanted to make you feel more comfortable with discomfort, with not necessarily knowing what was coming next, to put you in a position where you were largely in control of what might come next. This is an important thing to take on as an educator. 
to understand what that uncertainty might feel like and to be okay with it. We saw that particularly in the maths lesson where the discomfort levels were probably at their highest and we saw the body language change as you realise that what we were about to embark on was a mathematical worded problem. We wanted you to experience that discomfort and to then think about how as teachers you coach your students through that discomfort, through that uncertainty, because uncertainty is a factor of life. And as educators, we need to be preparing our students for an uncertain future, but to equip them with the confidence to tackle those unfamiliar problems, to develop strategies to solve those problems fairly independently, without reliance on a teacher to tell them precisely what to do. So let's think a little bit about what some of those values are that we're ch challenging um, and what values you are uh, holding dear. Do you value getting it right or do you value getting risks? Do you value exploring and wondering? Do you value doing what you're told? Do you value thinking independently and creatively or being compliant and obedient? Do you value independence of learning? Do you value a collaborative space or a cooperative space or individualistic space in your classroom? How do you help students to trust their own judgment rather than be reliant on you as the teacher to tell them how to think, when to think, what to think and what to do and how to do it? We've also, we believe, provided you with an opportunity to see how learning can connect to the real world much more strongly than many of the integrated studies units that you may have seen. We've tried to show you how something a little more authentic can be so highly engaging for your learners rather than um, endless quantities of worksheets. We've also demonstrated through role play how an immersion, how that can give that responsibility for learning to the student and again provide a much more engaging environment for them to learn in. I understand that as um, young adults, we and as even older adults, we can sometimes become somewhat inhibited but the importance of role play can't be underestimated. It introduces an element of playfulness into the classroom, which is sorely missing from universities at times. So we wanted to demonstrate to you the power of role play as fostering that sense of play. We've also emphasised the social cognition. It's very easy to assume that university students and school students understand how to learn together. But quite frankly, it's a learned behaviour. It's not necessarily an innate behaviour. Some of you are experiencing some issues within your group as you struggle with how to encourage each other and include each other, um, how you struggle with how to deal with those students who don't pull their weight within a group, how you come to grips with what is collaborative and what is cooperative when you're working together. It's really important that you understand those elements and you can see how we may have scaffolded you to think about some of those things through the team contract. Immersing you in all of these different pedagogies and experiences has been designed to challenge your thinking and to expose you to alternative ways of being a teacher in the classroom and alternative ways, importantly, of designing opportunities for your students to be immersed in similar approaches. In this slide and the next few slides, 
I'm going to walk you through the sorts of things that you've actually done so far in this course. And you might be surprised and amazed at exactly how much you've done. It's a huge amount of work that you've done and a huge range of activities that you've um, been immersed in. I'm using examples taken from this course from two or three years ago. Um, so whilst none of these will be exactly what you did, they are pretty much the same and you will be able to draw links to these images quite strongly, I believe. The first thing that you did was that you established teams with team identities and you learned about and explored ways of working better together. A large part of this investigation relied heavily upon the collaboration between team members. The investigation was constructed so that you had to rely on each other. And those teams who took a more individualistic and perhaps a cooperative approach may not have fared so well. Um, as those that took a far more collaborative approach where each other's perspectives were valued rather than divvying up the tasks to be done amongst individuals. So would you need to teach explicitly the cooperative and collaborative learning skills and teamwork to your own students in your own classroom? What about the students in Richard Battersby's, Battersby's classroom? Do they need more explicit teaching around cooperative learning? What other strategies might you think of in your own classroom or in assessment task three or both that foster the interdependence within teams? Very often when we introduce teams into a classroom, it's all about competition. But in this class, it was not about competition, not, not very often. It was about collaborating. How do you foster that sense of belonging to a team and the responsibility that comes with being part of that team? and to foster opportunities for collaboration between teams. You developed an alternative persona, an avatar in one sense, a different identity with a different background. For many of you, this helped you to see the problems from a different perspective. You got to pay, play a particular role, and it's often a teaching strategy that is underutilised. It was also fun to dress up. You also wrote... Your character profiles were a piece of writing that was stimulated by the use of interviews in character, as well as using the found objects that you had to incorporate into your profiles. The intent of this activity was for you to write creatively and coherently. How would you do this in the classroom? Who would choose the roles? Who would create the characters? What sort of scaffolds would you use to help children to write creatively? How would you assess this writing? You synthesised information from multiple sources and presented your conclusions each week. What sort of thinking did you engage in when making your recommendations? Where on Bloom's taxonomy do you think you were operating? Were you making judgments? Were you suspending judgments to visualise innovative possibilities? Were you evaluating different options? justifying, verifying, creating new ideas, comparing, analysing, assessing, assessing different options against the criteria of everything that you came up with having to be sustainable. All the time, each week that you were doing this, you were engaging in different sorts of technology. Some of you engage with the technology to a greater extent than others. And I think if you didn't choose to follow the recommendations we made about the weekly technologies, then I think you've missed an opportunity to bring yourself up to speed with what primary school classrooms might be using. So um, if you didn't, as a team, engage with Pinterest and ThingLink and the PictoChart and the other sorts of technologies that we suggested, perhaps that's an area that you might set as a personal goal to upskill yourselves in your own time. But you were engaging with technology as you researched and located ideas. Those teams who did go fairly deeply or go more deeply into their research will probably find that in their wiki, uh, in their Google site, they may have scored more highly than others. You represented your ideas on your Google site page and communicated with each other about your emerging ideas through a technological medium. The purpose behind, ask, behind asking you to engage with these different forms of technology was that you represented your understanding and the knowledge that you constructed yourselves in various ways, in multiple ways, using different 
media. This was either through text on your Google site, through the incorporation of images, or through the use of various other um, visual means, through annotating the maps, or some, I'm not sure whether any of you did this year, but in past years, some groups have made little videos using their characters um, to explain and present their recommendations. What ways will you ask your students to present what they know when you have your own classroom? In your assessment task three, what ways will you ask your students to represent the knowledge that they have constructed? I want you to think about some of those sorts of opportunities to represent what we know, what our students know, using a variety of means. Some technological, others that are not technological. You presented the ideas that you had synthesised from multiple data sources and you presented your recommendations. You were listening to each other and speaking with each other, trying to persuade us about your recommendations, justifying, verifying. You undertook further analytical thinking when you were asked to complete a PMI for the settlement you were responsible for or uh, a know what learn for your energy recommendations. So we're using some graphic organisers. Will you use graphic organisers like this? Why? Which ones will you use? What will you use in your classroom? What will, most, what will best suit the sorts of activities that you have designed in your own problem-based learning um, scenario or in how you adapt the island to Richard Battersby's, Battersby's classroom? Remember to justify why. Throughout the five weeks, you worked collaboratively, particularly when you were thinking about each part of the problem, each subpart of the problem. So this image shows how in groups you brainstorm different ideas. You collaboratively shared your ideas and opinions as well as the facts and beliefs that you had. You argued and you tried to reach consensus through a variety of means. We did this by putting you into a multidisciplinary team where different people with an eye to their professional role would bring a specific perspective to the discussions. We put you into discipline-based teams, so we got all of the engineers together to debate and argue and justify their choices of different forms of transport and energy. We put you in a disciplined team when the economists got together to brainstorm different ways of generating revenue for the island. How will you create these sorts of opportunities with your problem-based learning investigation? A couple of years ago, we used a variety of different brainstorming strategies to help with that collaboration. This is an example of how we used ideas, idea maps on the whiteboard and then we sorted the ideas for how our economy would generate revenue into um, different categories of products or um, revenue sources. We got you to use a non-technology way of sorting your ideas through the use of sticky notes that you randomly put down and then bundled into groups of um, similar ideas. And you did it all. You did so much thinking because as teachers, we did not do any telling. How much telling will you do? When you're on your placement, how much telling have you seen happen in the classroom? If you don't do the telling, what do you, the teacher, then do instead? And so when I was talking about that facilitation role through the questioning that your tutors have um, demonstrated and modelled that gets you to think even more deeply. We didn't do very much telling but we did engage in some explicit teaching throughout various points in the investigation. We taught you about the value of money, although many of you seem to have a pretty good idea about this already. Some grade fives and sixes might not be quite so um, fiscally savvy. We did this through that simple bartering activity, then blank paper, then money and an auction. Ideas about the relationships between supply and demand and the idea of scarcity. 
It was still a fun and engaging way of doing it, but it was an example of some explicit teaching about these concepts. Will you do something similar to this in Richard's class? What other things do you think might need to be explicitly taught if you are to adapt the island investigation to his classroom? If you're coming up with your own problem-based learning scenario, are there specific elements of it that need to be explicitly taught? And is explicit teaching the same as teachers telling? How might you do this, again, in a way that is student-centred and engaging um, and experiential? How do you find that balance between explicitly teaching different concepts and the process of self-discovery, which we know is a far more powerful way to learn? We also did some explicit teaching around voting systems by holding island elections. You voted for your settlement leader and then you, your um, nominees undertook some intensive campaign campaigning. How might you extend this activity in the classroom and what literacy focus is this addressing? Think about how you are speaking, using persuasive language, using emotive language. Which parts of the curriculum, the English curriculum, can you relate that quite fun activity back to? How might you scaffold your students into doing as great a job as, um, as you guys did in your own elections? So we held a real election with ballot papers and everything. With um, I'm hoping you had vote counters and scrutineers supported by some online resources from the Electoral Commission. What sort of resources will you think of to support your teaching in the problem-based learning scenario that you apply to Richard Battersby's classroom? So think about the sorts of resources and specific activities that you might need to incorporate. Our voting led to a healthy discussion about the principles that underpin our voting system. These were based on ideas of democracy, but also gave rise to consideration of alternative modes of government. Some of the directions that the discussion went into were unanticipated and not predicted. What sort of directions do you think you can predict your students will take in your own problem-based learning investigation? How much will you direct the learning and how much will you leave it open-ended? Some of you may have picked up that we did do a little bit of manipulation at times about where we wanted you to go in this particular problem-based learning scenario. But that was largely because we know that we had five single classes with you at university to model the sorts of thing experiences we wanted to model. In a primary school classroom, do you have similar constraints? Or do you have more time to allow the students to follow those um, at times tangential or unpredicted um, directions with their learning? Where do you sit? What do you value? That, in sense of, that sense of inquisitiveness and curiosity, of wondering, or uh, do you value sticking to the plan a lot more? Problem-based learning starts, tends to challenge the latter value. We integrated mathematics into our integrated studies unit in what I think was a really authentic way. We had a problem that needed solving and we needed to engage with our mathematical thinking in order to understand the scope of the problem and to solve the problem. But as a teaching strategy, we introduced this problem through the use of a picture storybook. Are there picture storybooks that you might think of using as a way to introduce a problem or to consolidate a way of thinking as part of your problem-based learning scenario? One other thing that we tried to model was the importance of centering your problem-based learning around a big idea, something that you want your students to understand but to do so on an enduring basis, not a concept you want them to think of as disposable, but laying a foundation for this enduring understanding that will be built upon in subsequent years. We were asking the students to think about sustainability and the importance of interconnectedness understanding the complexity of systems, of those economic, environmental and social systems that we all participate in. 
So think about the big ideas that underpin your problem-based learning investigation that you propose for Richard's classroom. Along the way, we've touched on a range of other ideas as well. What were some of these? What other ideas will your investigation cover? What objectives and learning intentions will you set for your students? So here are some of the Osvel's um, areas that I think we've touched on in this investigation. What do you think you learnt in these particular areas? And ref go back to one of your journal reflections where you did your concept circles. What knowledge, skills and understandings did you develop as a result of this immersive project? What will be some of the specific learning objectives and intentions that arise from your problem-based learning investigation? What content areas will your problem-based learning investigation cover? What's an authentic context for incorporating these or other curriculum areas? These are some of the questions that you ask yourself once you've centred on the big idea that you want to use as the basis for your problem-based learning scenario, whether this be for your assessment task three or for your own teaching. I wanted to provide you with another example of a problem-based learning scenario that has been implemented effectively in primary classrooms in the US and it's called the World Peace Game and I strongly urge you to Google John Hunter and the World Peace Game TED Talk. Sit and listen to it. Once you view, the, view his video, he's a compelling speaker and speaks with passion and authority about the positive impacts that this approach has on the learning of his fourth grade students. Um, once you've done that, do a Google search for the World Peace Game Feder Foundation, which um, has now emerged out of John's extensive experience in this particular area. And have a little think about how you might adapt his ideas to your own classroom. For those who've um, been a little investigative, I'm pretty sure that I have links to this and a couple of other examples in the learning resources on the course website. A final word about the purpose and the point behind this particular course and behind immersing you in the problem-based learning scenario. You've all heard um, Sir Ken Robinson talk about the role of creativity in education and how our current curriculum stamps that creativity out of students and teachers. When he talks about creativity, he's not just talking about art and performance and dance and music and the, um, the typical markers of a creative person. He's talking about the ability to think outside the square to think laterally and differently and divergently. And it's that thinking that is critical when you are faced with solving a problem. And this need for creativity applies equally to teachers as it does to students. It's one of the key 21st century learning skills that the world beyond school and beyond education is demanding from people as we move further and deeper into the 21st century. So in this particular uh, YouTube video I want you all to look at, it's titled How Can We Nurture Creativity in Educational Context? Do a search and it will come up. It runs for 2 minutes 20, really, really well worth it. And um, Elliot Eisner, who is featured in this, one of the, the, the many people featured in this short video, thinks of curriculum as a mind-altering device, which is a particularly, um, uh, I think, apt way of thinking about the sorts of curriculum that you design for your classroom. So what sort of minds are you altering in your classroom? What sort of minds do you want your children to have? This gets back to the idea of a curriculum that is centred on what the teacher tells the student rather than what meaning the student constructs for themselves as a result of the experiences that you immerse your students in. So I'm talking very clearly about a constructivist approach 
to learning in the classrooms that you manage. In this video, they talk about the, the song, the rap song in the background, or the hip-hop song, whatever it's called, um, talks about graduating from college but are still dumb. Are you graduating from university but are still dumb? Have I and your tutors in this course given you a chance to exercise the creativity and the thinking skills that you have in your minds? Have we altered your minds? That's the main point.